uh, where you will see uh, that we have a lot to look forward to in the coming year. Next slide. So 2022 was an exceptional year for GenMob. Overall, we made significant progress towards achieving our vision. And in 2023, we will continue to work towards our new 2030 vision, where our Kaiso antibody medicines are fundamentally transforming the lives of people with cancer and other serious diseases. We will start with bringing our uh, medicines to patients. First, we have Apcoritumab. This, as a reminder, we are developing together with Apfi. And we are very much looking forward to expanding development with new phase three studies and excitingly launching Apcoritumab in the US and in Europe. And of course, that is subjective to approvals in both uh, territories. And if Apcoritumab should be approved in 2023, it will join TIFDAC as the second general owned product on the market. And in 2023, we plan to work with our partner CISA to continue to broaden the clinical development program for TIFDAC and establish it as a clear choice for patients with metastatic cervical cancer. So now turning to our world-class differentiated product pipeline, we very much look forward to data from the clinical expansion cohorts and progress to next steps for both of the dual body molecules in development with BioNTech targeting 41BB. And you just heard one of them being described by Dr. Malero. And we anticipate expanding and advancing other early stage programs, including the potential for additional INDs or CTAs in the coming year. We have a number slotted, I can tell you. Have the right Having the right people and culture in place is essential for our success, and we intend to continue to scale our organization based on our planned portfolio development and business needs. And finally, we intend to leverage our solid financial base to support our growth, which could entail external opportunities. So taking all of this together, we have a lot to be excited about in the next uh, 12 months. So let's move to the next uh, slide. Now it's time for uh, Q&A. And I'm very pleased to note that we also have several members of our executive committee uh, here this evening to answer your questions. Our Chief Development Officer Judith is sitting here next to, uh, to our Chief Medical Officer Tai Yamari. And then we have our CFO Anthony Pagano and General Chief Operating Officer Anthony Monsini. And we will begin by taking questions from the room. And then we will open, up, uh, open the floor to questions from, via the webcast. I see several hands up already here. So that's a good sign. And to ask a question over the webcast, simply click the Ask a Question button located above the slide window and type in your question and then click Submit and then Andrew will uh, read out the questions later. So please, when you ask a question, just uh, mention your name so that, you, that the webcast viewers can actually hear uh, easily, uh, quite easily who is asking the question. And I think Thomas was first, Thomas, uh, and then uh, Michael here. Thomas, I think you get a microphone. Uh, and Brooke is getting very, very good exercise this evening because she's running around with microphones. And that gives you an extra minute, uh, Thomas, to think about a very sharp question here. Yes, thank you, Thomas, from Robert Dance Bank. Uh, <coughs> just a couple of questions on, on hexabody CD38. So, so, so based on, on, on the current safety profile and, and also some, some quite encouraging early uh, signs of efficacy, is this something that you believe will actually be able to, to replace daratumumab also in, in the first line setting? And, and then secondly, just on the, on the PKPD uh, profile, so you had a, a DLT at a 24 uh, mix. So I'm, I'm just wondering, when, when looking at the, at the tar target situation, um, how does daratumumab at 16 milligram compared to, to, the, to the RP2D, so the also the 16 milligrams uh, you're using for, for hexabody CD38. Thank you. Th thanks, Thomas. And I will ask uh, uh, Torben, and then uh, later on Ty to, uh, to give, his, uh, give their perspective. Torben. So realizing, so realizing that, uh, that uh, patients with myeloma and prior exposure to CD38 uh, antibody is a very difficult uh, patient population to treat, the idea is to enroll, focus on the enrollment of, uh, of CD38 uh, negative uh, patients, uh, naive patients, and, uh, and target them with, uh, with a dose expansion. And uh, I also think that you deserve uh, sometime in the future to have a head-to-head uh, -head comparison of uh, Dartumumab with Hexabody C38, and you will get that. And then maybe the second uh, question on the PKPD uh, profile, uh, or maybe Tai wants to go into that, Tai. Maybe answer. Um, so the first thing is um, the PK profile of C38 and it was the large degree is driven by the sink C38. So that's a consistent depending regardless of what antibody you use. Um, so the, and then the second part is the PK profile of hexabodies by and large behaves like a normal antibody. So consequently the PK for hexabody C38 looks very similar to the other one. Um, and that was also part of the idea of um, settling on a dose that is very comparable because it makes some of the, the arguments when you get into head and head comparison, a little bit more cleaner because you are actually comparing apples to apples to some degree. Now, that too much sub Q, Dosalex, is using a higher dose, but from a bioavailability, it behaves more or less, a little bit on the plateau, a little bit more than 16, but more or less like 60 milligram IV. 
Um, and so that's what we are aiming for, and as, as Tom was saying, um, all of this has been already discussed and multiple times communicated. We have an expansion cohort that's enrolling right now in Dara Naif, and then the next step will be the head-to-head comparison. I think it's probably fair to say that Dara sub Q will not necessarily behave exactly the same way in a population that is enrolled today than in the population that uh, was involved early on, 501, or the series study, which was just a different time and a different set of cares were available. So that's why in comparison we'll give the final answer on this. So we'll see. Okay. You yes, yeah. please. You ask about the PD biomarker. So if you compare the decrease of C2, which is the complement 2, which is a surrogate of CDC, and the drug is doing what meant to be. So when you compare the data that we presented with the data published for DARA, like six years ago, you see that the decrease of C2 on average by time point is like 48% with a hexabody, and it's around 20 with DARA. I mean, showing again that what we showed preclinically in terms of more potent CDC, high, you know, translates in the biomarker that measures CDC. So the dots are starting to connect. Of course, you know, <laughs> the proof is in the pudding. <laughs> Thanks, Judith. And I think Torben wants to get some further uh, color and uh, perspective. If, if you look at the uh, early data for, for Dartsumuma from 501 and the serious trials, 52% of the patients did not have a formal response according to MWG criteria, but they have a docking of their survival. So that speaks into the fact that CD38 is a very, very special target. Thank you. I think we move on to the next uh, um, questions from Michael Novot. And he is here, uh, Brooke, in the middle. The nice gentleman here with the blue uh, jacket. Can't miss him. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. Michael Novot from Nadia. Uh, so two questions for uh, Dr. Falci. Uh, so there's been a lot of discussion also at this uh, conference around how do you actually sort of pick the, uh, the right by specific because they're at least uh, for in development and, and they all seem highly active. So, so how do you say are the sort of the top criteria you think going forward in regards of, uh, of, of picking the right one between this, uh, this jungle of by specifics? And then the, uh, the second one uh, on, uh, on, on Richter's, uh, maybe that's more for the panel as such. Uh, what is the combination strategy in, in, in Richter and NCLL also given the, uh, the peer to data we saw in the same session? Yeah, so regarding how to pick by specific, um, there's, there's a factors that are beyond anybody's control. It's approval, label, setting, access, those are. But in terms of product themselves, one of the things that you need to remember about EPCOR is it's been developed as a subcutaneous administration since the start. And it's a very pure product, and which is probably the reason why it's a one-to-one -one drug that's probably a couple of orders of magnitude more powerful than most nutritional, for example. Um, and so the subcutaneous administration with a really reasonable, really low rate of sub, um, injection side reactions, most of which are grade one, is certainly an asset, certainly a strength. Uh, the, uh, the fact that it's administered so conveniently also makes it a very uh, uh, combinable agent as well. And this is true for some of the studies that are ongoing, some of the studies that I've presented. Uh, you know, if you have a two-hour infusion, that makes your schedule a lot difficult, more difficult um, than if you have a subcutaneous injection. Uh, it is uh, uh, associated with uh, lower rates of CRS than you would expect for a drug with that kind of EC50 in vitro, uh, which is potentially best in class. So. Um, you would have expected a little bit, you know, uh, sort of an important CRS rate, which you don't see. Part of the reason is the way that the uh, step up dosing schedule was developed, which I thought was clever. Lower doses early on, um, uh, leveraging the power of B cell clearance, and then higher doses later on. Um, part of that is subcutaneous administration, for sure, uh, or very, very likely. <laughs> um, uh, but that makes the drug very suitable for outpatient administration. And that's the second edge you have. And uh, I, I might have forgotten to mention in the presentation, but the phase three study is going to have uh, no longer mandatory but optional uh, hospitalization on day 15. This is key, uh, both in comparison to direct competition, but also in comparison to CAR T cell. Did you know CAR T cell is not offered everywhere in the United States or worldwide? There are patients that have to drive five, six, seven hundred miles to go get CAR T cell. Some can't uh, access that or can't access uh, high dose therapy and transplantation. And the next best thing is, frankly, single agent career. And so. Uh, you have several strengths, um, convenience, power, safety, that position that work very, very well. But I'll let Ty comment on the Richter side. Sure, um, thank you. Um, yeah, on the Richter study, I think the first part is um, to, to re-emphasize what Lorenzo was saying. For those of us who 
for me this is a little bit longer ago, but still, <laughs> um, I treated these patients to Invicta is essentially a milk transformed partial in form of CR. It's an incredibly hard to treat disease. Mm -hmm. And so the first part was to show that they actually with the signal agent get efficacy, and in some cases, as it appears, doable CRs. As it relates to combination strategy, what we always say is that we don't, uh, you know, preface what we're going to do before we're going to do it, but I think this is also not rocket science. But the standard, if there is such a thing as standard of care, how these patients get treated, though they get not the best of all responses, is essentially an approximation how the few such pieces gets treated. That happens to also be a regimen for which we have already generated safety data. I think you should stop here, uh, Tahi. Because uh, <laughs> you're trying to fish, of course, for the right combinations. And, and, and of course, we're willing to tell you that, Michael, but uh, there's also some competitors uh, who are also probably listening into this call. Yes, a question from City. Peter. Busy photographing, I saw during the presentation, so you're really uh, keenly on topic, eh? Thanks, Jan. Uh, people, people on City. Um, two questions, just coming back. EPCOR NHL 6. Uh, when will that data read out? Um, is that enough to get a regulatory filing in the outpatient setting? And maybe just to bring Professor Falky back in, you're clearly very relaxed to use this agent in the outpatient setting, but how would you, um, you know, what's your sense about the wider community, their willingness to use T cell biospecifics in the outpatient setting? That's question number one, and I'll, I'll pause there and wait for my follow up. I think the Reno, Reno should probably be Judith, I think. Yeah, uh, I and then Dr. Do, six. Then a six uh, read out. Study, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so we cannot provide the answer. What we can say is, as you know from clinicaltrial.gov, that the study is actively enrolling. And look, that's a complex conversation, right? You know, it depends on what stance the FDA is going to have. You know, this is not something that we can really speculate too much about. Uh, what I can say is the, the, the first step to even think about outpatient administration is, is lack of grade three CRS, right? Because that means patients require vasopressors, high level oxygen supplementation. We just haven't observed that. The other thing is there's a learning curve to this drug that's not even long, where if you look at adverse events by quote unquote era, some of the grade threes you would have observed early on, even in NHL one study, uh, it's kind of went away. We haven't observed any grade three CRS. So that's the first step. Uh, and then the second step is education, which many of us are going to be very willing to do with our colleagues, community colleagues. Um, you know, eventually this will hit the community, and um, you know, like any new drug, there will be a learning process. But there is a community there to be served, which are not from serving CAR T cells. So as, as complex as it seems now, I think it's actually going to be. I'm not actually have experience, but I, we all started somewhere. So. Thank you. And then, Jan, yeah, second question. Jensen, ten, well, you talked about 2023 priorities, but I thought one of the 2022 priorities was to make a phase three go-no-go -no -go decision on at least one of these 1042 or 1046. So we've seen the head and neck data, um, but we haven't seen you make a commitment to go into phase three. So what data are we waiting for, and when, when will we hear anything? <laughs> we are, we're following the data in time, Peter. It's not the end of the year, remember. We still have, uh, we still have time to go this year. Um, we are at Genmov, so, so we will uh, generate the data and in a rational uh, way. We'll then uh, take a very clear data-driven decision, not only for 1042, but also for 1046. And we'll update you then on the timing, uh, Peter. Let me uh, take one, uh, let me take two more, oh, three more questions here from the room and then we go to the uh, webcast. I think in the back, maybe you can uh, give your name and then uh, step in, because it's yeah, hey dark yeah. here. It's Michael Schmidt with uh, Guggenheim. Um, oh, Michael, thanks that, for that's my you. <laughs> <laughs> um, just another one on hexabody CD38. Um, I wasn't clear, was there a dose response and would you expect um, higher activity at the recommended phase two dose in the CD38 experience uh, patients? So that's question one. And then the second question was, I was just wondering if, if you could help contextualize the EPCO combination data in a second line uh, DLBCL transplant eligible patient setting um, that was presented earlier. I guess what, what, is, you know, what is the strategy here and what is the benchmark in the setting for activity? Thanks so much. Okay, thanks, Michael. I think let's start with Tobin and then, then Dr. Fauci. My expected, expectation would be that there will be a dose response uh, uh, curve and that we will uh, need to stick to these uh, 16 uh, milligrams per kilo. But I think that we saw a very excellent response at, uh, already at 4 milligrams per kilo. So it uh, can differ from patient to patient, but uh, as, a, as a general rule, I think we will need to, to stick to this uh, recommended phase two uh, dose. Thanks, Torben. Lorenzo? Now, as far as the second line, um, or the strategy, I obviously can't speak. I'll let <laughs> Dahi speak about it in, in, in the panel. But um, in terms of the data, uh, we, we were we were impressed with the data. And, uh, you know, there's a, in that very session, you know, it, it starts emerging the idea that if you, just, if you don't just do platinum, you can actually jack up the complete response rates. And 
now all of a sudden you're competing with CAR T cells, right? And, mm. and you didn't think so initially. Uh, so that, that was very pleasing to us. Uh, deliver, you know, delivery of the combination is something that it, you know, need to pay attention to, but those curves are really high up, and that's not what you see with human immunotherapy by, by, by a long stretch. Uh, but in terms of further developing it, that's, that's more complex. So. Thank you. Uh, first, Emily. Wait on the microphone, and then Matthew, and then we'll get uh, one more question here from the room. Hi, thank you. Emily Field from Barclays. Um, a question for Dr. Fauci. Um, the point you made in one of the follicular lymphoma trials about the conversion of um, PR to CR, is that, is that something that you're seeing um, as you accrue longer follow-up in these trials and could potentially be an advantage versus the fixed dosing regimen by specifics? Um, and then also just a practical question on the hexabody CD38 head-to-head um, -head trial, just how challenging you would expect enrollment to be given that it might be more difficult to find the CD38 naive patients. Mm -hmm. So as far as the conversions are concerned, uh, there are conversions, but they're not super late conversions. So you, you kind of see them within, a, within the follow-up that we had available, in fact. So um, I, I would uh, separate the conversion and the maintenance sort of uh, or prolonged therapy uh, issue. Uh, the prolonged therapy is something that has been put in place to, to prolong progression for survival, potentially survival, uh, particularly in later lines as much as possible. You know, you have the Gatlin data, you have uh, the second line maintenance data, you know, is something that's frequently done. Obviously, that's with monospecific antibodies, which are uh, arguably orders of magnitude less powerful than, than, than I've created them. So I'm actually very eager to say, because be, beyond the first couple of cycles, injections of I've created them are in incredibly easy for us and for the patients. It's mm -hmm. just literally coming in, getting an injection. In, in fact, injection side reactions are much less uh, ob frequently observed. So the convenience factor is also important for an acceptance, you know, administration. Um, so I, yeah, I think those are two separate issues now. I think yeah. Kai wants to, or Judith, you want yeah. to? Yeah, and um, for the other part of the question is picking the right countries and the right sites. <laughs> Very good. I think Matthew and then uh, Dennis Astika. Matthew? The recruitment of patients for patient bodies. Uh, more to the back. Yeah. All right, Matthew. Thanks. Uh, Matthew Harrison, Morgan Stanley. I, I guess two for me. So one on. One on EPCO, I, I was just wondering, Dr. Fauci, if you could just talk about how you think about durability, um, especially in the post-CAR T setting or CAR T experience setting, and how you, how you think about the durability of the agent, and, and um, you know, thoughts on maybe long-term durability for some patients. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the second question on hexabody CD38, maybe just remind us, um, should we expect head-to-head -head daratumumab data next year, or you know, what should we be thinking about in terms of timing there? Thanks, Matthew. So as far as the durability, I would uh, refer you to the presentation uh, looking at the progression-free survival and overall survival curves uh, where we see a, a plateau at some point in the curves, and that is always very promising. Obviously, this is continued therapy. It's going to be uh, very hard to say what would happen if you were to discontinue, but this is also a setting in third line plus where you don't want to play with fire. So if you have a winning team, it, it, it's hard to change. And as I said before, such a convenient therapy, um, so you know, easy to give. I, I don't know that I would do the experiment, you know, at this point. Um, the overall survival curve, particularly that stays up at, at over 40 percent, and I think it's close to 50 percent, is something that you wouldn't you wouldn't have seen up until now. So um, we have a you know, large cell lymphoma is a disease where you, when you see a plateau, you automatically start thinking about cure rates. Obviously, longer follow-ups necessary to uh, kind of demonstrate that, but all the good studies have started like this. So hopefully we'll see some good results with this too. Thanks, and then I think Judith wants to comment on the timing. Yeah, uh, we have hard plans to start next year ahead to head. All right, that's uh, Astika. Here in the front, yep. Hi guys, thanks for taking my questions. <coughs> Sorry, I'm losing my voice at the end of last year. Um, so, uh, in his presentation yesterday or two days ago, Dr. Hutchins discussed how um, CD20 loss might be a mechanism of resistance. Mm -hmm. um, and there was some debate uh, on, on the frequency in which this occurs uh, in the different lymphomas. And Dr. I was wondering if you could maybe tell us a bit about your experience with EPCO and some of the other uh, bispecifics out there. And is there any difference between um, the, the different bispecifics? Um, uh, uh, maybe you see a different rate of, uh, of uh, mm -hmm. CD20 loss um, uh, with that. And then maybe for uh, maybe Judith, um, there's also discussion on fixed dosing um, and how some doctors like, um, uh, like that, that, that this can help you better manage the late onset uh, infection risk. I mean, I'm wondering, do you think that that's a valid um, uh, angle to play at? And maybe is that something that you will also look at doing, maybe do a fixed uh, dose regimen of Pepco as well? 
put the fault sheet first on the CD20 loss. Yeah. So, so as you know, there's data across studies that look at mechanisms of resistance. Uh, and, and CD20 loss is the obvious one, um, which is consistent with the you know, dynamic mechanism of action. Um, uh, I have seen it in the EPRO studies, for sure, but I've seen it in other studies as well. I can't really say that the incidence is higher. And also, CD20 loss is only one of the mechanisms of resistance. I, I can't refer you to a review we put out just uh, a month ago, uh, looking at some of the other mechanisms of action. And we, the truth is we know very little about this. Uh, I know very little about this. And um, CD20 loss can, may or may not be reversible because it's been shown that some of it is related to, it's genetically determined. Uh, but the cases that are not, uh, we actually don't know if CD20 can reemerge over time. I, I don't get a sense that the incidence is, is different, which is not surprising. Th thanks. To fix those yeah. in. Yeah, I'm going to add something to that, but okay. I also think it's a bit heavy. Um, it's a, this quite phenomenon, but it is not the predominant mechanism of resistance for this mechanism. There are probably other biological mechanisms that are more relevant. Um, and then to the, to the, the, the notion of fixed dosing and um, uh, the potential infection risk, um, that's a uh, big topic. I think the first part is the idea that continuous T cell activation may lead to T cell exhaustion. We actually had a post on that, that um, instead of doing this in a tube, actually answers that question in patients, which is probably more relevant. And what you will find on the poster is that they are not getting exhausted. I think it's the first part. And that probably is the difference between just drawing life specifics in a lab and publishing some blood and continuously exposing them to us you know, what's actually having in vivo. And the second part is, as um, you saw, Leonardo you know, actually was emphasizing this uh, on one of the slides and uh, the updates of the uh, one study, we actually are showing that there are less events over time. Um, so um, in general, and also related to infections, um, as patients progress on treatment, as the disease gets better under control, um, and they are getting also in better shape because of better disease control, we see a significant reduction of these. It's something I can actually can answer. That the if you look at some of the CAR T cell data, CAR T cell live a long time, up to two, three years. And we've had more than one patient coming in with HIV levels, you know, T cell uh, numbers, uh, getting opportunistic infections that you wouldn't have expected to see two, three years in remission. We have not seen that uh, within the available follow up with, with that group. Thank, thanks. Let's see whether there's any questions from the, uh, from the uh, webcast. Andrew? No, sorry, there are no questions from the webcast. No questions, all right. Then we go continue with the room here in the back. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Christopher Udy from SCB. Um, so I guess this is a question for Dr. Felci. Um, would you please talk a little bit about the trade-offs uh, that you make when you would decide uh, the timing of uh, the dose schedule in frontline um, uh, LBCL with uh, RCHOP, our CHOP, and um, yeah, but basically, uh, the chop first or simultaneous. Hmm. I think the, the R chop we presented this at ASCO this year. The R chop EPCOR experience <coughs> was very educational for us. First of all, it showed, and I alluded to this before, the combinability of EPCOR being a subcutaneous administration. R chop, as you know, particularly cycle one, is a it's a day long treatment, right? Um, so having a drug you can combine is extremely valuable. Uh, the second, and maybe this is a point of difference with. Competition. I think administering RCHOP together with, our, with EPCOR, as, EPCOR together with RCHOP, as opposed to later on as it's been uh, done elsewhere, uh, is another point of strength because you leverage um, any synergism that you can get or additive effects you can get without detrimental effect on either component. Um, I also like the idea that we're able to start, we were able to start EPCOR on cycle one day one as opposed to cycle one day three or day two. Uh, because most of the benefit you get in large cell lymphoma, you really get in the first two cycles of therapy. So I think that perhaps that's the arm of the study where versatility and combinability of EPCOR was shining the most. Thank you. Uh, there was another. Yes, um, wait on the microphone. Thanks. Thanks, Brooke. Hi, Matt Phipps from William Blair. Um, on the Gen 3014, do you guys have any data on? CD38 expression levels for the patients that were prior treated, do you see any correlation with uh, paraprotein activity? And then secondly, did you expect to see any kind of dose response in some of the complement pharmacodynamics that you showed? Right. Uh, no, we collected the samples, but they are not yet analyzed for CD38 expression. Dose expression. Did you expect to see any no, yes. dose response with the complement? Yes. Yes. So yeah, yeah. So yes. Um, 
so you you see relatively early, I mean, this maybe also helps a little bit address and give more context to the initial question, okay. Um, there, there are two things I would like to draw your attention to, and these are complement and uh, other CD38 positive cells, such as the K cells that, that work as pharmacodynamic markers. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, what you see is, in effect, at lower doses for hexabody CD38 compared to the heart tumor, and a more profound effect at the recommended phase two dose for both aspects. Thanks, Kai. We have time for one more question. So who wants to ask the last uh, burning question? Yes. The lady here in front, uh, Brooke. Please go ahead. Hi, sorry, Carmen from RBC. Um, maybe just a quick comment on the uh, grade uh, two uh, or three CRS events. Um, we've heard at the conference that anything above grade one requires monitoring, and there might be um, some uh, concern that something that is grade two could progress to uh, grade three and above. So is there, um, yeah, interesting in your thoughts here and whether there it will be an education uh, thing for physicians? Thank you. Yeah, if you're, yeah the, um, so I agree. Uh, some of the, when I talk about the learning curve, some of the reduction incidence of grade three, I think, is related to us learning to use the drug better and intervene earlier when a grade two is there. Now, you're correct. Patients were admitted for that, cycle one, day 15, and I have had a, a patients that would have had a prolonged hospitalization by one day or two days because they might have had some additional fever, and obviously you're never sure if there's an infection or not, and you know, there's only so much control you have <laughs> on a patient when it's admitted. But if I thought of those patients as an outpatient, uh, truthfully, what they had was, was fever. Um, blood pressure might have been in the hundreds, one tens, or was, you know, high 60s, maybe 70s. But it wasn't symptomatic hypotension. There's no end organ damage. There's no um, oxygen requirement uh, of any real sort. And so it, I, I think it, it's something that, um, that exists. But uh, at one point, at least from my point of view, we have be a little bit courageous and then keep patients an outpatient, give them clear instructions, uh, give them a 24-7 access line. This is, these are all things that are going to be implemented if and when the, the, the drug would be, you know, I would imagine. That's what I would do. Um, and I'm confident that the great tools can be, can be kept outpatient. Yeah, I'm going to comment on this as well because this is my favorite topic. Um, <laughs> it really is, actually. And, and the issue with that is that um, the grading for CRS was developed in the context of CART. Yes. And it was intended to identify patients who go to the ICU versus the rest. So it basically was focusing on grade three. Grade two CRS, as it is currently defined, is a hodgepodge. And the hodgepodge is the equivalent of a patient who has fever, as Lawrence was just saying, and maybe you give him 500 cc's of fluids, and that's basically it. And the patient where you call the ICU to get a bed. Um, and that granularity is not there. So we've tried to provide that granularity, and I would encourage you to pay attention to how many patients actually require oxygen and how many patients just require fluids, um, because I think that actually differentiates. Thanks very much, Sky. On that note, <laughs> I think we're going to end our Q&A here. Thank you all very much for your questions. So next